Welcome back, Pastor. <clears throat> it's good to have you back with us again. And um, if you have your Bibles with you uh, this morning, please open up to Galatians chapter 5. I'm um, not going to be expositing um, this chapter, this verse, but a long time ago, I had started something which was going through the fruit of the Spirit. And so this morning, um, I'm just going to continue doing that. Um, and so in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22, we have the fruit of the Spirit. But if it's not too much for the congregation, I would ask if we could all stand to our feet so we can uh, pray over this sermon. Father God, I come before you and I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word and, and for us being able to be here safely and having the privilege of hearing your word. We ask, oh Father, uh, this morning, God, that we be able to see a better picture of Jesus Christ, that you warm our hearts, God, to who it is that you are, God. Uh, that we would love you, that we would honor you, God, that we would get rid of all excuses, that there would be a desire within our hearts to be men of integrity, people that love you, people that honor you, Lord God. Please do this, Lord God, this morning in our hearts in this church. We thank you, Father, for this, and we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And before you take your seats, let's just read verse 22, just out of tradition and practice. It's good to read uh, before we sit down, verse 22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amen. You may take your seats. As uh, Fratele Valer was mentioning, uh, yesterday we had a men's uh, breakfast. And, um, you know, one of the things that is uh, kind of frustrating, I think, in this modern age of the internet and, um, you know, you have so many, we all go to our homes and we all listen to our favorite preachers and we all uh, read our favorite commentaries and we all have different things that we are drawn to. And we come back and it's almost like a church that is just so divided on theology and there's so many different opinions about so many different things. And even yesterday we were talking about uh, the role of a, a, a woman in ministry and things like this. And there's so many different opinions and so many different things. And so uh, this morning, I would like to think that what we have before us is a topic that we can all agree on. And there's no kind of variation on um, the meaning of the passage. And so um, this study through the fruit of the Spirit has, for me, been very beneficial uh, obviously, the person that preaches, you're going to remember your own sermon, right? And so for me, it's been extremely beneficial being able to go through these and being instructed as to what God expects of me, right? Being instructed as to what it means to be a man full of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to spend time expositing uh, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, David did so a little bit this morning already, um, but this is the fruit of the Spirit, right? It belongs to the Spirit of God. It is what the Spirit of God does in us. I was having a conversation just a few days ago. Someone asked me a question, still a little bit confused on the role of the Spirit within the life of a Christian. And they were asking me, well, are, do you only have the Holy Spirit when you speak in tongues? You know, and, and we had to look at passages that talk about the fact that all of us as Christians have the Holy Spirit, right? And so as Christ professing Christians, these are things in here that all of us have to have, um, things that the Spirit is doing in us. But at the same time, we have the instructions in Galatians 5, verse 16, it says, walk by the Spirit. Then in verse 18, it says, if you are led by the Spirit, right? In verse 25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, there's also this command, there's also this expectation of us uh, concentrating and, and giving ourselves over to look upon what God expects from us and then walking in that, right? Being full of the Holy Spirit, making sure that we're in the Word, that we're staying away from sin, that we are uh, in prayer, right? So that we can be in the Spirit of God. Um, and so this morning, what I want us to look at is kindness and goodness. And I've grouped these two together uh, for a specific reason, but... Um, I guess the sermon this morning is go not going to be a very conventional sermon in the sense that what I want us to look at is Jesus Christ himself. And I, I believe that every sermon, um, every pulpit in, in America ought to have preachers that showcase Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ in every passage of this Bible. That's what Jesus says, in fact, right? Jesus says that all the scriptures spoke about him. 
And so how foolish would it be to have preachers standing before congregations and just giving a list of rules or giving a list of expectations. But what we ought to be seeing is who God is, his attributes, his character. And as we see more of who he is, we are drawn to him because we have the spirit of God. We love him more. We appreciate all that he is and and our hearts within us long to be just like him, right? And so what I want us to do this morning is actually just to look at uh, who Jesus is and to see who he is. Now, for me, this morning, I was blessed by David, and, and, and I love that type of preaching, you know, preaching, an, preaching against sin and this kind of boldness. And uh, I love that because I think we live in an age where our religion has become kind of mushy, right? Um, just so superficial, and, and we don't even have the proper definition of love and, and, and kindness and, and all of these different things. We, as one preacher says, we believe in the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice, and we don't believe the other 10, you know? And, and that's kind of what we become, and not necessarily this church, but that's just the popular Christianity that we have out there. And so it's, it's always good to have uh, that type of preaching. And, and so I'm drawn to that. And I think one thing that we as people do is we categorize things. We systematize things, right? And so what we do is we'll take an idea of who God is. For, for some, like myself, I'm prone to think primarily of God as a holy God, right? God is holy. He hates sin. And so as I walk through my life, it's so easy for me to always see a God who is like that and to just think in, in one dimension of that. And so I begin to think of of a God who maybe when I sin or fall down, he's also hard on me, and he's cold-hearted toward me, maybe. Obviously, I wouldn't use those words, and I would never actually accuse God of that, but by practice, that's how I believe so many times, right? Then you have the opposite extreme, where maybe there's people that primarily think of God as someone who is nice, or kind, or, uh, or whatever it may be, right, along those lines, and so they begin to abuse grace, Right? Well, I've fallen into sin, but it's okay because God is he's a nice God. He's a kind God. He's going to forgive me. And, and there begins to be a lack of conviction over sin, and you begin to live a life uh, that is just sinful. Right? And so us as, as people, we categorize things, we systematize things, and we systematize God. But what we see in Scripture is this beautiful balance of who God is. We see a Jesus that is angered by sin and goes into the temple and overturns tables. But we also see a, a God in Matthew 11 that, that we're going to look at. And says, come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, right? We see a kind God, a, a gracious God. And so what we're looking at today is kindness in Jesus Christ. And what I want us to do before we even dive into there, because I want us to be reminded of the gospel, because I think what we are so prone to do as people is when we hear a sermon, we'll say this, yes, this is a good sermon for that person or for this person. Or what we'll do is say, yes, I know I have to be kind, I know I have to be loving, but not to that person, right? I I know I have to be a servant, and I will gladly be a servant to this person, to that person, because they're genuine Christians, but I don't want to be a servant to that person, because look what he does, and look what he's done, or or look what, what he lacks in doing. And I want to put that type of pettiness and foolishness in light of the gospel, Because if we understand the gospel, and so many of us have been walking as Christians in the gospel for so many years, and yet, logically, it doesn't make sense the way that we live our lives. Because the gospel is what? In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, it says that while we were enemies, Christ died for our sins. And and we see a beautiful correlation of that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Right? So we were enemies of Christ at one point. We were people that hated God. And then in this, in this passage, Jesus tells us, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter's preaching the gospel to the people, he's saying, And this is Jesus whom you crucified. I think we forget that so many times, right? It is our sin that put Jesus up on that cross. And sometimes it's good for us to individualize it, to remember that, that it was our sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. And so now put our pettiness of, well, I won't serve that person because he's not worthy of it. He he doesn't even care. He doesn't even recognize when I serve him. He won't even say thank you. Now put that in light of the gospel, which says this, Jesus Christ looked at us, he 
He gave his life for us. He loved us while we were enemies, while we spit in his face, right? That's the gospel. And we are called as Christians to live in light of that gospel. So logically speaking, is there any, any time, any circumstance that we can look at and say, I should not serve that person? No, we should be eager. As Jesus Christ was eager to give his life for us, we should be eager to do that. Uh, one passage that has stood out to me back in Matthew chapter 5 is actually the passage before the one I just read, uh, verses 38 through 42. And again, me personally, just my, I'm so prone to being so against this mushy type of religion. I really do believe that Jesus Christ is a strong God, right? He stands for truth. He doesn't compromise. But we also see a, a kindness and a love in him and That is amazing as well. Look what it says here. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. What I want to take from here is just one principle. And just to look at the idea of even us as Christians going above and beyond, going backwards, or whatever we, we can do to serve one another. Making it practical, maybe uh, camping's coming up, and we're thinking, well, uh, I know I have to prepare food, or I have to prepare this, and, and there's all sorts of things that I can do, and I have my family to take care of. Uh, and then we start thinking, okay, well, what can I do for everybody? And then maybe we're prone to think, well, I would do all of these things, but I know that that family won't do as much as I'm going to do. I know that that person is not even going to appreciate what I'm doing. So you know what? I'm going to take a step back. I'm not going to do anything. And I want us to take that type of thinking that I believe we're all prone to. Absolutely, all of us are prone to. And I wanted to take that type of thinking and put it up against the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. Not just past, but currently, right? If it wasn't for the blood of Christ that covers us, today we, are, we would have already sinned enough to earn hell, right? And so it is the love of Jesus Christ, the kindness of Jesus Christ that rules the way that we live our lives. It is not someone else's... Uh, actions toward us someone else's attitudes toward us but it is what the attitude of jesus christ toward us that determines the way that we act towards other people and so i wanted to mention that only because i think we're so prone to always toss sermons upon somebody else or to always uh to to not want to be i guess you could say taken advantage of but in one sense uh, maybe this isn't the best way of saying it but in one sense jesus christ was taken advantage of in one sense right where we didn't deserve what he gave us, but he gave it to us freely. In Matthew 18, and this has kind of nothing to do with what I'm preaching about, but just because it's on the topic, so many times what we do um, when someone sins against us is maybe we harbor anger in our hearts, right? And so because of that anger, we act a certain way. Or we can go to the other extreme, and I think it's very well-intentioned, and we'll say this, well, I'm going to forgive him. And what we mean by that is, I'm not going to approach this man and tell him the wrong that he's done and help him by correcting him and making him look more like Jesus Christ, but I'm just going to forget what he's done and act as as if it never happened. But the clear instruction from Scripture is this, Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, have gained your brother. And then it goes on further instructions. But my point is this. How should we act at Victory Church in this place? If there are people that have sinned against us, Scripture clearly commands us, yes, to forgive them, but to also go and to have a conversation, right? Look, this is the standard of Scripture. This is how we ought to live in light of the gospel, in light of who Jesus Christ is, and you've fallen short in this area. And in doing so, it says you have gained a brother. You have helped him, right? It is a selfless act on your part. What we are not to do is to ignore or to keep it to ourselves, to harbor anger, or the list goes on, right? And so I want us to just think about those things. In, in light of what I've just said, I want us to look at who Jesus Christ is. And I want us to turn, uh, first of all, to Matthew chapter 11, and just to see Jesus Christ. 
going to read from verse 28 of Matthew chapter 11. It says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. This is the God whom we serve. This is the invitation that Christ gives to every single one of us. And I find it so beautiful that I, this morning, can stand and look all of you guys in the eyes and I can say that we serve a God who has wide open arms to you. Right? No matter what you've done, no matter how much you've sinned, God, this morning, has open arms to you. And again, I don't want us to take advantage to abuse the grace of God, absolutely not. And I think we're all mature enough to understand all of that, right? There is a high calling that Christ is calling us to. 1 Peter 1.16 tells us, be holy as I am holy. In Matthew 5.48 it says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's a call for us to live a holy life, right? So that is true, but like David was saying this morning, we all fall. And, And I know one of the things that I am so prone to doing as well as when I fall is is I want to distance myself from God because I have this view of God. Well, God is so holy. He's so righteous that if I've sinned, how can I possibly enter before him in his presence? But how beautiful is it that our God is the God who invites you? He says, come to me. He's inviting you. He says, come to me, all you who labor or are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a promise from God. How many of us are burdened by our sins? How many of us are burdened even by uh, the anxieties of this life, right? And all throughout Scripture, we're not talking about that today, but all throughout Scripture, the, the Bible speaks against anxiety, right? Again, logically, if you believe the gospel, if you believe in a sovereign God and a God who works out all things for your good, you will have peace, the peace of God. All of it is rooted in the gospel. And, and God, again, here in this passage, as Jesus is describing himself, is sharing with us his own heart, who he is. He's telling us that he's going to give you rest. It's a promise. Isn't that so encouraging for us, right? He says, take my yoke upon you. And it's important to know here that there still is a yoke. There still are expectations. There still is a Bible that we must follow and learn from you. We, we must sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. But it says so beautifully, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One of the things that has so helped me is uh, preaching the sermon on the previous uh, attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, patience. Because I realized just the patience of God, the patience of God in the gospel towards us. And then us as people to realize that if there's people around us that maybe don't understand theology as much, or maybe people around us that don't care as much as us, or maybe people around us that uh, sin more than us, that if we were to have the attitude of Jesus Christ that he had for us, what would we be doing but be patient with these people, right? We would be gentle with these people. We would care for these people. We would never look down upon these people. And that's what we see here in this passage. He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus is not saying, come to me and let me rebuke you harshly because you've fallen again in sin. But he's saying, come to me because I'm gentle. I'm lowly in heart. Right? In Psalm 34, 18, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. If we look, if we were to do just a massive study throughout Scripture of the man that the Lord loves, it is that man who is humble, the man who is low. Jesus is almost attracted to these types of people, people that aren't full of themselves, people that don't pretend like the rich young ruler that they have lived out the commandments of God, people that don't treat Jesus Christ as just a help in their life, but that they recognize Jesus Christ as a necessity in their life. I want us to look just a little bit because we're already in Matthew at a couple different verses. Matthew chapter 9, just quickly going through these. 9 verse 2 says this, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic laying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Beautiful to note that this man didn't even need to open his mouth. But I, I believe that the compassion that Jesus Christ had that was so deep within him, when he looked upon this man and saw the need that he was in and saw their faith, as the passage says, 
he, forgi- he forgave their sins. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36 says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is the God, the same God today, who has compassion on his people. We see, I think, a church today in America that can be described in the same manner as this verses 35 and 36, right? Helpless, harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So many times Christians in this world don't have maybe a proper shepherd, aren't in the right church, but we see the attitude of Jesus Christ for them. It's not harsh. It's not looking down upon them. It's one of compassion. It's this compassion that flows from the heart of Jesus Christ, and that is awesome. And I find it so awesome that, you know, for us, when we think, when we think of a man, maybe this is just me, but I think we're all prone to it, right? We think of a man that is maybe uh, truthful, he, he does right, he, you know, he wakes up early in the morning, never misses work, never calls in sick, he just does his thing, and, and usually we think of that man as someone that is kind of lacking emotion, he, he's kind of more cold, right? But at least he does those things right, you know? He, he sticks to those things. And then we have other people that are maybe more emotional, maybe compassionate, but they're not, they're not always punctual. They're not always doing their thing, you know what I'm saying? But we come to Jesus and we see a God who is truthful, who is strong, who is mighty, who, who never compromises, yet at the same time is also full of compassion. I, I just think that's a beautiful balance that we all ought to aspire to. Continuing on to Matthew, Matthew 14, 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick, right? In Matthew 15, 32, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. Am I an unwilling to send them away hungry? And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Again, seeing the compassion of Jesus Christ, Right? He didn't, he, he didn't have this attitude of, well, I, I've been giving them so much spiritual food this whole time. They owe me. Uh, or, or they should be happy that they get to see God himself in the flesh. Nobody else has, in, in thousands and thousands of years have gone to see this. But no, he had compassion on the people. And, and, and there's other passages. It's already 1152. We're not going to look at them. But there's so many passages. My point is there's so many passages where we see the compassion of Jesus Christ that he has on his people. And what I want to impress upon us is if this is who Jesus Christ is, then who ought we to be? Right? We should be people full of compassion. And what I want us to do, and even take two or three seconds if I have to accentuate it in that way, is to think about us. Who are we as people? Are we a people that are compassionate? And not in the sense of when people see me, right? Obviously, on a Sunday morning when we come here, we're all going to be nice people. We're going to be nice to each other. We're going to be some sort of compassionate. When we can serve one another and other people see us serving, of course, we're going to do that, right? But I'm saying in the depths of your heart, I like Psalm 101 where David, I think David's the psalmist there, he talks about the integrity of his heart, right? Integrity, right? When nobody else sees you, right? What does your heart look like? Are you compassionate, right? When someone's going through things, are you like Jesus Christ and does your heart hurt for those people or does it not even bother you? And if it doesn't bother you, that, that's a sign that that's something that we need to pray to God about, that God will soften our hearts, that we may be like Jesus Christ. Just to look at a p- couple other things about Jesus Christ, uh, to see who he is, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to quickly go through these things so we can look at specifically kindness after that. <clears throat> but in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we see something else in Jesus Christ. I'll just read from verse 1, uh, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race <clears throat> that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The attitude of Jesus Christ in this verse. He's dying on the cross for you and I, 
And it doesn't say that he did so unwillingly. He said, for the joy that was set before him. From the beginning, from the foundations of this world, Jesus knew his mission, that he would come and die for us, right? So that we can be together with him into a relationship that is unparalleled. And this is what Jesus is looking forward to. He's going to die on this cross, but there's a joy in it for him. Why? Because he knows he's going to be in this relationship with us. That's the attitude, the love of Jesus Christ towards us, the compassion of Jesus Christ toward us. And that's instructive for us. Why? Because we can say, well, when we're serving, when we're helping, when we are sacrificing resources, time, whatever it may be, for the benefit of other people, what is our attitude? Is there a joy within us or are we doing it because we know it's just the right thing to do, right? The attitude matters. I don't have it written down. It's, I think it's Deuteronomy 28, verse 44, something like that. And I'm not going to get exactly what it says. But there God judges the nation of Israel because it says, because you have not served me with joy and gladness. And so we see a God who actually commands our emotions as well. We see a God who doesn't look at just our form, right? But he, he sees our hearts while others... Maybe you can fool all of us here. And maybe you can uh, get yourself a really good reputation amongst us. But God sees all of our hearts. He sees if we're compassionate. He sees the reason why we do the things that we do. Right? There's a couple other. Let's look real quickly because it's so beautiful as well. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. And then we'll move on to a couple of different passages. But Hebrews 4, <clears throat> Verse 14 through 16 says this, Since then we have a, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I think if all men in this world were to try to come together and, and come up with a better gospel, a better story for us, it would be impossible. Here's God who's perfect, and he didn't just say, look, I'm going to come and die on the cross for you. That's already amazing in itself. But he came down as a man and was tempted as we were in his humanity. Why? So that he can sympathize with us. And so no matter where we are in our lives, we can never say, God, you don't get it because you're God. You don't get it because I'm a man and you're God. You don't get what I'm going through. No. Jesus went through it. Jesus went through it. And yet, how perfect he is, yet without sin. And then verse 16, so beautiful. Look at the invitation again that God gives to us. Let us then with confidence. Are we deserving of this confidence? Absolutely not. Who are we to draw to the throne of God Almighty with confidence, but not on our merit, but because of who God is, because of the kindness of God? It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive what? Mercy and find grace and to help in time of need. This is the God that we serve. Amen. And what I want us to just meditate upon, obviously I'm not saying anything new, but I want us to meditate upon this morning is just to see who God is, how compassionate, how loving he is, and how much that ought to dictate the way that we live our lives, right? Quickly, let's look at also a couple passages about specifically kindness. In Romans chapter 2, and I see the time. Romans chapter 2. Let's read from, let's just read verse 4. It says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your heart and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. We see the point of God's kindness. Now, like we were talking about before, obviously any gift that God gives us as sinners, we can take that and, and misuse it, Right? There will be people that will look upon the grace of God, the kindness of God that he offers us and see that as a license to sin, as a license to do whatever they want. Clearly, the word of God tells us what's happening. They're storing up wrath for themselves. But the kindness of God is meant for something else. It's not meant for wrath to be stored up for us. The kindness of God is meant for what? Is meant to lead you to repentance. And so how do we act so many times when 
we're faced with other brothers and sisters who are in sin. We're so impatient, right? Like, how do you not get it? How do you not understand the gospel? How are you still dealing with this sin? Yet God is so patient with us. God's probably thinking the same thing of us. How are you still dealing with this sin? It's been years, decades maybe, and yet God is patient toward us. And it's, and it's out of his kindness. It's out of his kindness that leads to this patience and forbearance with us. Romans 11, verse 22. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Again, we see same, kind of the same thing that we saw in the other passage. And there's so much more to this context here. But what I want us to look at is specifically the kindness of God towards us, right? Again, we see that he loves us, that he's kind towards us. And the point of his kindness is for our repentance, that we may be with him in his church, in his body. Ephesians chapter 2. And there's so much to say about Ephesians chapter 2. But let's just read, let's just read verse 7. So, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Right? Again, kindness, kindness, kindness. And I'm just kind of... I guess, badgering us with all of these verses just for us to just be almost inundated with the kindness of God, to realize what Scripture says about the God that we serve. Yes, He's a God who's holy, who's righteous, who demands perfection, actually, who demands for us to live blameless lives. Uh, That's how Job was characterized. That's how Joseph was characterized as blameless people. That is something that God wants from us, but God recognizes that we do fall, and God is kind and compassionate toward us. Now, it's 12.01, and and I kind of grouped kindness and goodness together, um, but let me quickly kind of just go over these two words uh, in it by themselves. Kindness, in, in the Greek word, basically means a gracious attitude, the quality of being helpful and beneficial. And then goodness is it says this, finds its fullest and highest expression, that which is willingly and sacrificially done for others. It is the moral and spiritual excellence manifested in active kindness, right? And so kindness and, and goodness are grouped together here because it is not just about having compassion in your heart. It's not just having a, a kind attitude towards others, but this goodness comes in here as well, instructing us that we also have to do something, right? And in my mind, James chapter 2 comes up. Right? What does it say in James chapter 2? It says it so clearly for us. Verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's kind of the same thinking here. Okay, you have kindness. But the fruit of the Spirit is kindness and goodness, right? It's not just you feel bad for somebody who's in need. But it is this going out of your way, this goodness, uh, this good attitude of your heart where you're going out of your way to help somebody out. Why? Because you're so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus Christ that he's had for you, by the kindness that God is actively having toward you, that you can't do anything else but do the same thing for other people. And that's, as, that's what as a church we're called to do, is to... Be in the gospel. And this is what I've been realizing, I think, this whole year, is just how deep the gospel of Jesus Christ is. I mean, it is so deep. It, it, it's everything that we need to talk about. In the gospel, at the cross, we find everything of who God is. Every attribute of God, every kind of command and expectation of who we are to be, we find it in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we're only to go in deeper and deeper into the gospel, we would see that so many of the things that we do are illogical. It doesn't make sense. It's hypocritical of us. It's hypocritical of us. It's not right of us. It's illogical of us to treat each other in any other way but to be extremely loving and kind to one another. It doesn't make sense, right? Here we are as the people proclaiming the kindness of Jesus Christ saying, 
saying here, saying here, look, look world, this is the gospel. Jesus died for me while I'm a sinner and you're a sinner and Jesus loves you as a sinner and wants to, wants to save you from that, right? This is what we proclaim world and now I'm gonna go about living with just a mediocre type of lifestyle, right? Something that we call love, something that we call and that's what I see from Scripture, right? In, in Matthew 5, verse 33 to 48, right? You have heard it said, love your neighbor. All of us can do that. But when we go deep into the gospel, love your enemy, right? All of us can have peace when things are going right. But like Matthew chapter 8, in the midst of a storm, Jesus looks at the disciples who are in the midst of a storm on the boat, and he's saying, they're saying, Jesus, don't you see the storm around us? And Jesus is saying, you, ca- you cowards, you have little faith. Don't you see that God is right next to you? The God who commands these storms? Why are you afraid? You see, there's so much supernatural things going on in the gospel. And and, and the fruit of the Spirit that we're looking at, they're supernatural things. We're not talking about kindness that pagans out there in the world can exhibit. There is a type of kindness that pagans in the world can exhibit. But we're talking about a, a kindness that is so different that for the normal man without the gospel is illogical. But for the man in church... It is illogical to live any other way, but to be extremely kind, extremely loving. And so I want us to just meditate upon those things and to uh, look upon our hearts and to see, God, am I that man of compassion? Do I look like Jesus Christ in my kindness toward other people, in my compassion toward other people? And so let us stand to our feet and let's come before God and examine ourselves and ask God that he would work in all of our hearts to be like Jesus Christ in this way. Amen.